Our scriptures, we're continuing along the journey of Jesus from his birth to the family's escape to Egypt, the return to Nazareth. Last week, we looked at Jesus being baptized. And now we come to perhaps a familiar story, often that we read the very beginning of Lent. We're not quite at Lent yet, but we are on our way. We're reading from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. If you'd like to read and follow along, you can find it on page 3 of the New Testament section of your pew Bible. Matthew 4, 1 through 17. Then, and this is after Jesus' baptism, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Well, then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. But Jesus said to him, Again, it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All of these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. He left Nazareth and made his home in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what has been spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, on the road by the sea, across the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. And for those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. God, give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that are open to receive and respond to your word, your message to us this day. Amen. John Smith was the only Protestant to move into the large Catholic neighborhood. On the first Friday of Lent, John was outside grilling a big, juicy steak on his grill. Meanwhile, all of his neighbors were eating cold tuna fish for supper. This went on each Friday during Lent. On the last Friday of Lent, the neighborhood men got together and decided that something just had to be done about John. He was just tempting them too much to eat meat each Friday of Lent, and they just couldn't take the temptation anymore. They decided to try to convert him to be Catholic. They went over and talked with him, and they were so happy that he decided to join all of his neighbors and to become a Catholic. They took him to church, and the priest sprinkled some water over him and told him, You were born a Baptist. You were raised a Baptist. And now you are a Catholic. The men of the neighborhood were thrilled, and they were really relieved. Now their biggest Lent temptation had been resolved. Next year's Lent rolled around again. The first Friday of Lent came, and just at supper time, when the neighborhood was setting down to their fish dinners, came the the smell, the aroma of steak cooking on the grill. 
The neighborhood men could not believe what they were smelling. What was going on? They called each other up and decided to meet over in John's yard to see if he had forgotten it was a Friday in Lent. The group arrived just in time to see John standing over his grill with a small pitcher of water. He was pouring small droplets over his steak on the grill and saying, You were born a cow, you were raised a cow, and now you are a fish. (laughs) Often, when we come to this passage in scripture, the temptations of Jesus, we think of specific areas of temptation, like food, or habits that we try to avoid in in life in general, and specifically during Lent, which we will be entering into as a community in a few weeks. And Lent is this wonderful opportunity for us to reflect on our dependencies, to resist temptation, and to rely on God's Spirit to strengthen us for the journey ahead whatever that journey looks like for you, and wherever that journey is leading you. However, when I looked at the story again, and this time of life in Jesus' story, I believe that it's much bigger than the everyday, sort of ordinary things that many of us may be tempted by. This story that we read is about allegiance, priorities, and identity. It's not just about putting down the bag of chips or putting back the ice cream at the grocery store. This story in Jesus' life and this story in his passage for us today is about who we are and who God is calling us to be as people. It's much more about our identity than any particular area of our life that we're trying to avoid. Now we read and we know that immediately after his baptism, which we looked at last week, Jesus was, was led or was sent by the Spirit into the wilderness for 40 days. We just sung that hymn. Now Jewish listeners would instantly recall the story of famous prophets Elijah traveling 40 days in the wilderness, seeking refuge from Jezebel. Moses fasted for 40 days while on Mount Sinai before receiving the the law of God for the people. The Israelites, of course, spent 40 years wandering the desert before reaching the promised land that they were anxiously anticipating. And all of these stories, through waiting, through suffering, through trials and temptations, God's people had not only their beliefs tested, but their character was tested in preparation for what lay ahead. And none of them really knew what was going to lay ahead of them. But this was a time of preparation And God was behind it because God knew the plans in the future, even though the individuals and the people may not have known, God did. As 15th century monk Thomas A. Kempis once wrote, we usually know what we can do, but temptation shows us who we are. And this is our story as well. For universal truths are relayed about humanity's nature, the character of God, and also the lure of temptation. How will we, as people, deal with temptation? How do we deal with tests when they come our way? When we are at crossroads and have to choose this or that? And one is very tempting. Oscar Wilde once quirked, the only way to get rid of temptation is to yield to it. I can resist everything but temptation. Fortunately for us, Jesus was able to resist. 
When Jesus is in the wilderness, his relationship with God, which had just been declared and reaffirmed at his baptism, well, now that becomes in question. Did God really open the heavens and declare his love? What does that mean if we are really beloved children of God? The tempter will come, and the tempter often comes the other voice in your head. And maybe you've heard that voice before, saying, oh, you're not good enough. You don't measure up enough. Did God really say that you were loved? No, you have to perform. You have to be perfect in order to earn God's love or in order to earn love of other people. We hear that voice, which tempts us to believe things are not true, and then at times to make decisions that will take us on a different path. These temptations that Jesus faced are common to us all. The first temptation really symbolizes materialism, the need to always get more or feel that we are what we own and that we are self-made. We've earned everything ourselves And we can take care of ourselves. We don't need to be dependent upon God for anything. God, we're we're good. The second is security and protection. And the third is power and reputation. And all of these come into our lives at various times in our lives. The temptation for materialism, wanting more stuff, for security and protection and for power and reputation. So Jesus, right after his baptism, he is led out into the wilderness seeking maybe answers and certainly being tested. Does Jesus really trust God with his protection, with provision, And with his future, I suppose these are the same questions for us. Not just during the season of Lent, but for us today and this season of our life. Do we really trust God with our needs? Do we trust God with our protection, provision? Do we trust God with our future? These temptations... Another word for that is tests, are really universal in nature, but often they differ based on context and life's situations. At various times in all of our lives, we will come to crossroads or encounter situations and decisions that have to be made that will put to test our faith, maybe our beliefs and our character as well. We may find ourselves in the wilderness, unsure of what lies ahead. And maybe you are finding yourself in that situation today. I want to share another story of an individual. My father, Gary Haug. One of the first big decisions my father had to make as a young dad was a choice, a choice between his personal and professional aspirations, career goals and dreams, or the needs of his young family, after it was discovered that I was coming into the scene. Surprise, surprise. My dad chose not himself. He chose us. He chose our future and not his own. And I can only imagine that it was tempting, and it was a test. For going to finish his PhD studies at the University of Notre Dame, go Irish, my dad and my mom moved back home to Massachusetts to have me, and then later to have my sister Lauren, and to raise our family surrounded by our grandparents and our aunts and uncles and our cousins, and it was a wonderful upbringing. But, of course, this required him to do jobs that he wasn't originally planning to do or hoping to do, working multiple jobs, from seafood supply to restaurant management, package and delivery, and retail. 
all for us and for our future. Now, I'm sure at the time that my father did not know all the implications of that one decision when he was standing at that crossroads and how that one decision would impact future generations, including myself and my sister. But certainly, it was a test of trust of God and a test of priorities as well. And based on that one decision, as challenging as it probably was, he instilled in us the importance of family, of hard work, of making time to create meaningful moments to be together. Yesterday, my dad turned 70 years old. We were able to celebrate together. And I'll always be grateful for his example, which has remained with me today and has influenced me And it's helped me to make decisions that would be best for my family. And I can guarantee you all this. The reason I'm standing here today in Stowe, Vermont, is because of the example of my dad's decision and why he made his decision. My wife and I made this decision a few years ago not knowing what it would look like. And there was temptations to make decisions to do something else and to go elsewhere. But we trusted. We felt in our hearts the Lord's leading. And we relied on God's Spirit to guide us, to direct us, not knowing then all of you, not knowing the blessings that would come into our lives, not knowing that God had a plan far greater than just us but that would include all of us in this church and in this community. But sometimes we come to the crossroads and we don't know what it will look like if we step in this direction or in this direction. But we have to trust. We have to trust in God's leading in our lives and stand firm on the promises of God, which is what Jesus did. Jesus knew the word of God, believed the word of God, and stood firm on those promises to be able to resist the other voices that are constantly swirling in our heads, often trying to tell us the opposite. And I think one of the key factors for Jesus being able to resist these temptations, and for us as well, is remember what happened immediately before he was sent into the wilderness. At his baptism, literally the heavens were torn open and the voice of God said, You are my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. You see, Jesus received God's love. He knew he was secure in his identity as a beloved child of God and did not need to seek security or protection or power from someone else or somewhere else, as tempting as it was. Friends, we can do the same. When we believe that there is a love that will never let us go, That no matter what we've been through, what we're struggling with, how weak we may feel or how weak we may be, that there is a love that is holding on to us for dear life and will never let us go. When we believe that, hear that voice, the voice of God, the voice of truth, and we receive that, then no matter the tests and the temptations we face in life, we can stand on the promises of God. And follow the Lord's call upon our lives wherever it may lead. So whatever tests or trials or temptations you may be facing in this season of life. Know that it's never too late in life to stand up against those other voices. Stand up against temptation and to stand on God's promises. For the Lord has great plans for us, plans to prosper us and not to harm us, plans to give us hope and a future.
May this be true for all of us. And know that God is with us to empower us to live a life of faith now and always.